Readings from the Liturgical Year by Dom Prosper Garanger December 27th, St. John, Apostle and Evangelist Nearest to Jesus' crib after Stephen stands John, the Apostle and Evangelist. It was only right that the first place should be assigned to him, who so loved his God that he shed his blood in his service. As this God himself declares, Greater love than this hath no man, that he lay down his life for his friends. And martyrdom has ever been counted by the church as the greatest act of love, and as having, consequently, the power of remitting sins like a second baptism. But next to the sacrifice of blood, the noblest, the bravest, and which most wins the heart of him who is the spouse of souls, is the sacrifice of virginity. Now just as St. Stephen is looked upon as the type of martyrs, John is honored as the Prince of Virgins. Martyrdom won for Stephen the crown and palm. Virginity merited for John most singular prerogatives, which, while they show how dear to God is holy chastity, put this disciple among those who, by their dignity and influence, are above the rest of men. St. John was of the family of David, as was our Blessed Lady. He was, consequently, a relation of Jesus. This same honor belonged to St. James the Greater, his brother, as also to St. James the Less and St. Jude, both sons of Alphaeus. When our saint was in the prime of his youth, he left not only his boat and nets, not only his father Zebedee, but even his betrothed, when everything was prepared for the marriage. He followed Jesus and never once looked back. Others were disciples or apostles. John was the friend of Jesus. The cause of this Our Lord's partiality was, as the Church tells us in the liturgy, that John had offered his virginity to the man-god. Let us, on this his feast, enumerate the graces and privileges that came to St. John from his being the disciple whom Jesus loved. This very expression of the gospel, which the evangelist repeats several times, the disciple whom Jesus loved, says more than any commentary could do. St. Peter, it is true, was chosen by our divine Lord to be the head of the apostolic college and the rock whereon the church was to be built. He then was honored most, but St. John was loved most. Peter was bid to love more than the rest loved, and he was able to say in answer to Jesus' thrice-repeated question that he did love him in this highest way. And yet, notwithstanding, John was more loved by Jesus than was Peter himself, because his virginity deserved this special mark of honor. Chastity of soul and body brings him who possesses it into a sacred nearness and intimacy with God. Hence it was that at the Last Supper, that supper which was to be renewed on our altars to the end of the world in order to cure our spiritual infirmities and give life to our souls. John was placed near to Jesus, nay was permitted as the tenderly loved disciple to lean his head upon the breast of the man-god. Then it was that he was filled, and from the very fountain, with light and love. It was both a recompense and a favor, and became the source of the two signal graces which make St. John an object of special reverence to the whole Church. Divine Wisdom, wishing to make known to the world the mystery of the Word, and commit to Scripture those profound secrets, which so far no pen of mortal has been permitted to write. The task was put upon John. Peter had been crucified, Paul had been beheaded, and the rest of the apostles had laid down their lives in testimony of the truths which they had been sent to preach to the world. John was the only one left in the church. Heresy had already begun its blasphemies against the apostolic teachings. It refused to admit the incarnate word as the Son of God, consubstantial to the Father. John was asked by the churches to speak, and he did so in language heavenly above measure. His divine master had reserved to this, his virgin disciple, the honor of writing those sublime mysteries which the other apostles had been commissioned only to teach. 
The Word was God, and this Word was made flesh for the salvation of mankind. Thus did our evangelist soar, like the eagle, up to the divine Son, and gaze upon him with undazzled eye, because his heart and senses were pure, and therefore fitted for such vision of the uncreated light. If Moses, after having conversed with God in the cloud, came from the divine interview with rays of miraculous light encircling his head, how radiant must have been the face of St. John, which had rested on the very heart of Jesus, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. How sublime his writings! How divine his teaching! Hence the symbol of the eagle shown to the prophet Ezekiel, and to St. John himself in his revelations, has been assigned to him by the church, and to this title of the eagle has been added by universal tradition the other beautiful name of theologian. This was the first recompense given by Jesus to his beloved John, a profound penetration into the divine mysteries. The second was the imparting to him a most ardent charity, which was equally a grace consequent upon his angelic purity, for purity unburdens the soul from groveling egotistic affections and raises it to a chaste and generous love. John had treasured up in his heart the discourses of his master. He made them known to the church, and especially that divine one of the Last Supper, wherein Jesus had poured forth his whole soul to his own, whom he had always tenderly loved, but most so at the end. He wrote his epistles, and charity is his subject. God is charity. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Perfect charity casteth out fear, and so on throughout, always on love. During the rest of his life, even when so enfeebled by old age as to not be able to walk, he was forever insisting upon all men loving each other, after the example of God, who had loved them, and so loved them. Thus, he that had announced more clearly than the rest of the apostles the divinity of the incarnate word, was by excellence the apostle of that divine charity, which Jesus came to enkindle upon the earth. But our Lord had given a further gift to bestow, and it was sweetly appropriate to the virgin disciple. When dying on his cross, Jesus left Mary upon this earth. Joseph had been dead now some years. Who then shall watch over his mother? Who is worthy of the charge? Will Jesus send his angels to protect and console her? For surely, what man could ever merit to be to her as a second Joseph? Looking down, he sees the virgin disciple standing at the foot of the cross. We know the rest. John is to be Mary's son. Mary is to be John's mother. O oh, wonderful chastity! that wins from Jesus such an inheritance as this. Peter, says St. Peter Damien, shall have left to him the church, the mother of men. But John shall receive Mary, the mother of God, whom he will love as his own dearest treasure, and to whom he will stand in Jesus' stead, while Mary will tenderly love John, her Jesus' friend, as her son. Can we be surprised after this, that St. John is looked upon by the Church as one of her greatest glories. He is a relative of Jesus in the flesh. He is an apostle, a virgin, the friend of the divine spouse, the eagle, the theologian, the son of Mary. He is an evangelist by the history he has given of the life of his divine master and friend. He is a sacred writer by the three epistles he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He is a prophet by his mysterious apocalypse, wherein are treasured the secrets of time and eternity. But is he a martyr? Yes, for if he did not complete his sacrifice, he drank the chalice of Jesus, when, after being cruelly scourged, he was thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil before the Latin gate at Rome. He was, therefore, a martyr in desire and intention, though not in fact. If our Lord, wishing to prolong a life so dear to the Church, as well as to show how he loves and honors virginity, miraculously stayed the effects of the frightful punishment, St. John had, on his part, 
unreservedly accepted martyrdom. Beloved disciple of the babe of Bethlehem, how great is thy happiness! How wonderful is the reward given to thy love and thy purity! In thee was fulfilled that word of the Master, Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Not only didst thou see this man-god, thou wast his friend, and on his bosom didst rest thy head. John the Baptist trembles at having to bend the head of Jesus under the water of Jordan. Magdalene, though assured by his own lips that her pardon was as perfect as her love, yet dares not raise her head, but keeps clinging to his feet. Thomas scarcely presumes to obey him when he bids him put his finger into his wounded side. And thou, in the presence of all the apostles, sittest close to him, leaning thy head upon his breast. Nor is it only Jesus in his humanity that thou seest and possessest. But because thy heart is pure, thou soarest like an eagle up to the Son of Justice, and fixeth thine eye upon him in the light inaccessible, wherein he dwelleth eternally with the Father and the Holy Ghost. Thus was rewarded the fidelity wherewith thou didst keep intact for Jesus the precious treasure of thy purity. And now, O worthy favorite of the great King, forget not us poor sinners. We believe and confess the divinity of the incarnate Word, whom thou hast evangelized unto us. But we desire to draw nigh to him during this holy season, now that he shows himself so desirous of our company, so humble, so full of love, so dear a child, and so poor. Alas, our sins keep us back. Our heart is not pure like thine. We have need of a patron to introduce us to our master's crib. Thou, O beloved disciple of the Emmanuel, thou must procure us this happiness. Thou hast shown us the divinity of the Word in the bosom of the Eternal Father. Lead us now to this same Word made flesh. Under thy patronage, Jesus will permit us to enter into the stable, to stand near his crib, to see with our eyes, and to touch with our hands the sweet fruit of eternal life. May it be granted us to contemplate the sweet face of him that is our Savior and thy friend, to feel the throbs of that heart which loves both thee and us, and which thou didst see wounded by the spear on Calvary. It is good for us to fix ourselves here near the crib of our Jesus, and share in the graces he there lavishes, and learn, as thou didst, the grand lesson of this child's simplicity. Thy prayers must get us all of this. Then, too, as son and guardian of Mary, thou hast to present us somewhat of the tender love wherewith she watches over the crib of her divine Son, to see in us the brothers of that child she bore, and to admit us to a share of the maternal affection she had for thee, the favored confidant of the secrets of her Jesus. We also pray to thee, O holy apostle, for the church of God. She was planted and watered by thy labors, embalmed with the celestial fragrance of thy virtues, and illumined by thy sublime teachings. Pray now that these graces may bring forth their fruit, and that to the end in her pilgrimage, Faith may be firm, the love of Jesus fervent, and Christian morals pure and holy. Thou tellest us in thy gospel of a saying of thy divine Master, I will not now call you my servants, but my friends. Pray, dear saint, that there may come from this, from our hearts and lips, a response of love and courage, telling our Emmanuel that, like thyself, we will follow him whithersoever he leads us.